Good morning. Good morning. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the joy of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. We welcome you to virtual worship from the Dover Church at 17 Springdale Avenue in Dover, Massachusetts. We are excited that you are here to join with us in spirit here at the Dover Church, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And we are a people of good news here at the Dover Church, and we have some good news to share with you. Our own Rodney Peterson, who has had a remarkable career here in the Boston area, was awarded the Mountaintop Achievement Award for his work for racial justice and reconciliation in the Boston area on Thursday night. And I was able to be there. I was a little sad it was a Zoom. I would have loved to have been able to be part of a crowd witnessing his uh, recognition and the recognition of five others. But it was a great day. And we thank you, Rodney, for all that you do to draw us together with our neighbors who live in the next town over and further away. And more good news, it's also Rodney's birthday. So very happy birthday to Rodney. Um, and Alyssa Fallon will also be celebrating a birthday this week. So we lift them up in celebration. If you see them or bump into them, be sure to wish them a happy birthday. Or you can just drive down Springdale Avenue and the Petersons <laughs> yellow house on the right and beep as you go by. Um, and you know, that way you'll get the Denisons too while you're at it. Uh, a little more good news, our stewardship um, ministry is well underway, and um, we thank everyone who's participated so far. That's 40. Um, we're probably expecting 140 pledges all told, so we're a little under a third of the way there. And we've received $95,000 and some change. Um, and so, thank you. If you are hoping or planning to participate, the sooner you do so, the better. It's not that I don't want to talk to you, but you may not want me to call you in, on this matter. Um, we really do appreciate all your gifts, uh, large and small. Um, thank you so much, and God bless you. We are excited to be offering a Zoom Sunday School event today. At 11.30, our young people will gather on Zoom to spend about an hour, 45 minutes, talking about service. Um, they'll be learning about Martin Luther King Jr. and the way he served our country, talking about gifts for service, and then making thank you cards for healthcare workers in the area who've been using their gifts to serve us during these difficult times. If you would like to have your family be part of this Zoom event, it's not too late to sign up. You should have received a link in your email for, from a Christian Ed eblast. If you need that link and you did not receive it, feel free to reach out to Jessica or to me, and we'd be happy to send it to you. There are still a few kits for this event available for pickup outside the church in a bin. So it's not too late to jump on. The event is today at 11.30 on Zoom. And um, we also have a deacons meeting at 11.20 this morning, I'll be sending out the link for that. So if you are a deacon, um, check your email. We'll meet at 1120 to talk about how we're going to care for the church in this coming year. If you have prayer requests that you would like lifted up um, later in our service at our time for community prayer, feel free to type them into the chat. Or if you'd like to share them with me privately, you can text my phone at 508-269-8406. And let us be in a spirit of worship. If you would look at your orders of worship and we'll say together or responsibly these words from the 40th Psalm. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. May all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, the Lord takes thought for me. You, you are, are my help and my, and my deliverer. Do, Do not, not delay, delay oh, oh my God. We have a special guest cantor this morning, Kristen Griebel, who will be singing with Christine for the Healing of the Nations, number S50, and we welcome you to join with them.
I'd like to invite all of you to find a comfortable seat where you're able to sit up tall with your feet below your knees and your head rising right up from the base of your spine, lowering your shoulders down away from your ears and sort of just relaxing but staying attentive. And we're going to do a little silent meditation this morning on trusting in God. My experience in the many years that I've been doing silent meditation and contemplative prayer is that it is in silence that we realize how far we are from trusting in God. All the things that come up to our mind, the things that we have to do, the things that we're afraid of, the things that we wish we had done, the things that anger us, are all the things that we should be able to turn over to God and let go. So, sitting up tall, I'll ring the bell, and you can close your eyes or not, whichever makes you feel safest, and we'll come into our breath. We begin by just following our breath, closing our mouths and breathing in through our nostrils and feeling that cool air going up through the top of our head and down into our abdomen, then opening our lips and blowing out through our mouths. And then breathing in through our nostrils Sending that breath all the way down to the bottom of your pelvis and then out the warm air comes through your lips. And just allow your inner eye to follow that breath. And we remember the words of scripture, how God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Eve, and they became sentient. Letting go and relaxing into the cycle of your breath Whenever a thought should come up, a bill you need to pay, an errand you need to run, an anger you need to express, just release it and say to yourself, great is the Lord. And we return to our breath, breathing in and breathing out. Allowing the muscles of your face to relax. Great is the Lord, and return to your breath.
If you can set aside five minutes a day to just let go of all the things that tell you you're not okay and that life's not okay and that everything's not going to be okay, you'll be working your way into a relationship of trust in God where our true blessedness lies. Amen. Today, as we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr., for our moment with the children, we get to look at footage compiled by the nonprofit SALT of one of his biggest and most successful, most well-remembered protests, marches, the March on Washington. This weekend, we celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. If he was still alive today, he would be 92 years old. And what we're watching right now is video of one of the marches that he organized, the March on Washington. Hundreds of thousands of people came from all over the country to Washington, D.C. to protest and draw attention to the inequalities that African Americans faced a century after slavery ended that still continue today. This protest is where Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. It makes sense that we remember MLK each and every year. We still have so much to learn from his legacy. But I also like this video because it shows all of the other people who were there that day. People who aren't famous, like Martin Luther King. People who are ordinary, just like you and me. We don't often get to see videos of these ordinary people, but they are important too because God calls some of us to be prophets, to talk in front of a lot of people about how we can be better at loving each other, just like Martin Luther King did. But God also calls people to listen to and follow the prophets that are sent our way. Each of these people in this video had the courage and the faith to listen and to follow when they heard God calling, to go out and march and protest for justice. They risked making their families angry or worried, or getting fired from their jobs, or being arrested or hurt by the people who didn't want these racist policies to go away. But they had the courage and the faith to listen and to follow anyway. And so these ordinary people became part of something extraordinary. Let us pray that we all may have the courage to listen and to follow to wherever God and God's prophets call us. Amen. Amen. We have two scripture lessons this morning, both that talk about how the righteous people reject the words of the prophets. And I invite you to listen to them as Kayla reads, to think of your own reaction to when you hear words that challenge you. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Here ends our first reading. And our second reading also from the book of Matthew. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you build the tombs of the prophets 
and you decorate the graves of the righteous, and you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you testify against yourselves that you are descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your ancestors. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how can you escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets, sages, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town, so that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I tell you, all this will come upon this generation. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me a moment? Open my lips that my mouth might show forth your praise. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the things that makes human beings different from all the other sentient creatures is we reflect on our experience. We try to understand what our experience means. We try to understand where it's going. We try to think how we could be doing it better. And we explain it, and we argue with each other about it. And from the furthest, deepest memory of human experience, we have been doing this reflecting, and we call the people who do this, philosophers, lovers of wisdom, or theologians, people who find words to speak about God. Now, of course, I'm just inferring that this philosophy and theology goes all the way back to the beginning of the human experience. We don't actually have records all the way back, but I can tell you this. A few summers ago, Mari Lore took me to see the Neolithic cave paintings in France, paintings that go back 35,000 years. And to see them, you have to climb way down underground into this place of darkness that's totally complete. And as you're climbing along, you can feel the millions of tons of earth and rock above your head. And you feel the dripping of the water, which is not coming down as rain, but is literally circulating inside the living earth. And you come to a lighted cha chamber. And there, on the walls, are painted handprints, and animals running, and occasional abstracts. Now, I myself obviously have not lived the human experience those Neolithic philosophers and theologians lived, but the moment I saw it, I absolutely recognized that they were explaining through their art what their life was all about and the role of the holy in it, their God. That I was in their temple, not way above ground, but far below life above. And on the walls, they had painted on the stone, just like carved on the stone, their wisdom, their words for God. 
And this painting and writing down and carving is the thing about philosophers and theologians. They are all just human beings like the rest of us. They look around themselves at the human experience and they think about what it is. And they come up with explanations and solutions. But because they are humans, their explanations and solutions are always limited. Limited by the range of their minds, and their minds are limited by the range of their vision and imagination, and their imagination is limited by the range of their experience. Now, for normal mortals like us, they seem wise and brilliant. But in reality, they are just reflecting a predisposition to the world from which it emerges. They're saying back to the world that which already is. Now, you may not think about this very much, but I do, and I've come to believe that all of us have our philosophers and theologians. We may not know their names. We may just have absorbed their thoughts and their God words. The things that resonate with us, we're drawn to. And yet, those thoughts just confirm us in our predispositions, and still we say, aha, this is truth, this is fact, this is reality. But then we come to church, or we go to the synagogue, and we meet these other people, and they're called prophets. The word in Hebrew is navi, which means a spokesperson or an announcer. And these people are chosen by God to share God's truth, God's reality, God's facts. And while we do revere them by putting what they announce in the Bible, the truth is that most of us hate their guts because the words they speak are always disturbing to how we want our lives to be. They poke holes in what we think is the truth. They pull out the foundation from what we think is reality. And they proclaim our facts to be half-truths or even lies. The prophets are always disruptive and corrosive and undermining of what we want to be, the truth, the facts, the reality. And we human beings hate that. We hate being put off balance and being told that we're doing it all wrong. But my friends, the truth and the facts and the reality that the prophets speak, if you really listen to them, is of a world that we have never seen or lived in. And that is why we know it comes from God, because it is not yet. And because it's so disruptive, that is why prophets invariably end up getting imprisoned, defamed, or killed. Because most of us, most of the time, do not like to feel like we're being held up to that kind of a bright light. We prefer to stand in a light that catches us in the best light. Now Martin Luther King was such a prophet. He took all those books of prophecy from the Bible, the prophets of Israel, the words of Jesus of Nazareth, and he shined that light on modern America. And people hated him. You know, it's 50 years on now, and everyone loves Martin Luther King. But he was beaten and imprisoned and bombed out of his house and stabbed and ultimately assassinated. And my friends, the truth is, I never felt closer, closer to Martin Luther King than when I came to the Dover Church because I learned that in the history of the Dover Church, there was a pastor named Dean Clark, who was here from 1964 to 1985, who marched 
with Martin Luther King on civil rights and stood up with Martin Luther King about Vietnam. And while everyone loves Dean Clark now, I know that there were three votes taken to remove him from the ministry, all of which he wasn't removed from. But right here in this place, people did not like to hear that prophecy. Now, 50 years later, in 2021, King's prophecies are more pertinent, more relevant, more urgent than ever, particularly the four he came back to over and over and over again in his preaching, in his work, in his marches, the obvious one, racial injustice and discrimination in our country. The second, poverty, irregardless of the color of your skin, the disparity between the rich and the poor in this wealthiest country of our world. The third, American military imperialism. He was talking, of course, of Vietnam, but it goes on. And the fourth, complicity, or at least moral weakness, on the part of the American liberal church in the face of racial injustice and poverty and militarism. And I think, well, maybe we don't all agree, but I think these four problems are even worse now than they were in King's time. But a sermon is not a time to go over facts or interpretations of political points of view. A sermon is a time to go to the doctors. When I was a young man, I never go gave going to the doctors a second thought. When I was young, my height and weight were always going up, and that was good, and I never had any problems. But now, in my 57th year, I'm of an age when I go to the doctors with a lot of thoughts. First of all, I wonder if anything's going to be going wrong. You know, the truth is that my height's going down and my weight's still going up. But I wonder, is the doctor going to say, you need to see the cardiologist? Or do you need to see the audiologist? Or do you need to see the urologist? Or, of course, the dreaded oncologist. Now, we all know people who prefer not to know the truth, and they don't go to the doctors. They just take life as it comes. And we all know other people who do go and hear the prognosis and the treatment plan, but still choose to do their own thing. And then there are those of us who go and hear the prognosis and get the treatment plan and choose to dive in. But when it comes to our communal life, our life together as a church, or our life together as a town, or our life together as a commonwealth, or as a nation, we prefer not to go to the doctor. We prefer to listen to our philosophers. Even though we ought to know that they are only telling us what we already want to hear. We know. We either watch CNN or Fox News. We either read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times. We believe one more than the other. But my friends, the question for faithful people like us is do we honestly prefer to stake our lives on political and economic philosophies that only perpetuate the world as we know it? Or are we going to go to the prophets and trust in God and work towards a world that has never yet been, but that only exists in the mind of God and comes to us through the mouths of prophets? It's amazing how we've romanticized Martin Luther King Jr. He's sort of a black Santa Claus now. But you know, 
he would invite us to actually dive into what he really said and to read what he really wrote and to try working on the things that he really worked for and see what that's like and what they tell us about the state of our souls. Every prophet, including Jesus, tell, tells us that the treatment plan is going to be painful. It's going to be just like going on a massive diet or undergoing chemotherapy or learning how to walk again after being having your legs crushed in an accident. But that's how we honor prophets like Martin Luther King. By looking at the world in the light that they shined and allowing their vision to change how we see our lives and the world and where we should be going. Amen. One of the songs that the people who marched with King and were beaten with King and hosed with King and had dogs set upon with King sang to remember that their trust was in the Lord their God is, not, is number 476, We Shall Overcome. We invite you to sing verses 1, 2, 5, and 6 with Christine and Kristen.
us be together in the spirit of prayer. The Lord be with you. Loving God, awesome creator, author of all that is and all that is yet to come, we gather before you in spirit this morning, grateful that while we are physically kept far apart, your spirit of creativity, of community, of worship and prayer, bind us together as one, as your body. We feel the wind blow through the trees outside, rattle the window panes, and we feel your presence. God, we give you thanks for your nearness today in song, in messages from those in our community, in words preached to hearts that need to hear them, in prayers answered. God, we give you thanks for your nearness and for your love. And out of that love and that longing to be close to us, God, you send us prophets to help us better understand how you are speaking to us every day. This morning, we give you thanks in particular that you sent to us Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. We thank you for MLK, for the way he and so many other prophets have reminded us of your care and your grace for all of your children, even the very least. We give you thanks today on Dr. King's birthday weekend for the qualities that shaped his life, qualities that we feel called to strive for, a strong sense of justice, an unshakable belief in love, a commitment to sacrifice, an ultimate trust in you. God, we mourn what the world did to him, what we did to him the pain, degradation, finally death. But we celebrate the dream for which he stood, of a society where the lion and the lamb could lie down together, children of all backgrounds and races, could be together in friendship and harmony. God help us to be committed to that dream, just as he was to care as much about the poor, the voiceless, and the disenfranchised as he did, to be prepared to work, to toil, and to journey, to bring that dream into reality. God, teach us to love all of your children, all of our neighbors, as our brothers and sisters, to care as much for our neighbors as we do for ourselves. God, we give you thanks for the voice of Dr. King, the way that your voice spoke out through him. Give us ears to listen, God, for we need more of your voice today. We see a world devastated by this virus, God, and we need your voice. We cry out under the burdens of isolation and anxiety and grief that weigh on so many of our shoulders. God, we weep with those who have lost relationships, who have lost futures, who have lost a sense of grounding those who have lost the very material necessities, we pray with those who have lost health and those who have lost jobs. Our hearts break 
that so many people we love could be in a position of want. We pray for all those struggling to find work, struggling to pay mortgages and college bills and to put food on the table, God. We know this is not your vision for the world. We pray for your healing. We pray for all those who are sick and struggling with this virus. We lift up Christine's friend, Laura, and the many close friends of the Haineses suffering from this terrible virus. We pray with him for his mother, Anne, as COVID cases have appeared in her assisted living home. We pray for all those who suffer in body or spirit because of this virus. We pray for healing, wholeness, for a recovery. God, we pray for your breath to fill those lungs so that they can feel the refreshment of air flowing through them once again. We give thanks for all the healthcare workers who continue to sacrifice, who continue to experiment and care, work long, long hours, their own safety at risk in the interest of our health. We give thanks to our young people who will gather this afternoon to write them cards expressing our deep, deep gratitude for their service. And God, we need your voice as we face as a community the many trials and challenges in this walk of life. This morning we pray for all those battling cancer, walking long paths of treatment, remission, of uncertain diagnoses, of uncertain futures. We pray with the Haines for Bob, journeying with advanced lung cancer. We pray with Lori for her college friend, Susie. God, we ask that you could stretch out your arms of comfort and healing and wrap these beloved children up in them, that they could feel your nearness and know that every step they take, they do not take alone. We pray for all those loving on someone with a long-term illness, that they could be connected to your strength and your resiliency. For God, it is sacred but exhausting work to love one who is ill. You are the divine physician, and so we pray to you for wholeness and for healing. And God, we remember that in our darkest moments, you weep with us. And so we lift up this morning all those who grieve, praying that your comfort and your peace could be with them. We lift up Bob Cruikshank, a longtime former member of the church who has passed on to your presence and your glory. We give you thanks for his life, for his service to this community. We pray you be with his family in this time. We lift up Pat, Pat Havlin on her passing, who we pray with Ted and Anne and Ricky and their whole family in celebration of her life, a world made better because she was in it. We pray that you would be near to all of them as they grieve and as they remember, and that you would help us to continue to support and to further Pat's values in our community and in the world. And God, we pray with him on the passing of his Aunt Alice. We give thanks for her life and that she is resting in peace with you, far from suffering or tragedy. We pray, God, for him and his whole family. As they celebrate and remember, while unable to gather and mourn and lift her up as they otherwise would. 
God, we pray for our nation, for many of us feel we are grieving. The events of these past weeks, destruction and violence, senseless deaths, are deeply disturbing. We lament this new normal that we have given our children. We look to the future, even to the next few days, with fear and uncertainty. God, we just ask you to guide us and our nation on paths of peace, to embolden and convict our leaders with wisdom and decency in a heart for the communities they serve, even the least of those within. And we ask that as the Spirit moves among us, God, inspire us with your purpose and stir in us the desire to serve you faithfully as we seek to live and love and be your body in this divided country. For God, the evils lamented by MLK of racism and materialism and militarism, they are still very much here. We pray your guidance in moving all of us closer on that long arc that bends towards justice. God, you send us prophets. You send us prophets to comfort those who are afflicted and to afflict those who are comfortable. Give us ears to hear, hearts ready to receive both comfort and challenge. For you created us and you love us and you made us to live together in community. We ask for forgiveness for the many times we have failed to hear the words of the prophets you have sent our way to show us how to live in that community. God, put before us and never let us forget all the work that we have yet to do to achieve the dream of unity and equity of peace spoken from the lips of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Fill us with your vision, God. Guide us by your vision in working to build the beloved community where everyone is welcome and all are valued, power is shared, and privilege is no more so that we could be architects of a world where all your children know wholeness and well-being. We pray all of these things in the name of your son who taught us to pray together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Amen. Scripture says they went out singing. Our hymn of parting today is a particular favorite of Dr. King. Precious Lord, take my hand. Number 470 in your hymnals.
pray that whatever blessing you might have received this morning, there were so many, that it takes root in your heart and nourishes you as you go forth into the world and bears fruit. You know, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And he meant it. It doesn't mean staying at home, being comfortable, but it means going up forth and shining your light into the world of your particular gift of love and forgiveness and reconciliation. Think about that as we celebrate our day off tomorrow. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance unto you this day and give you peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.